Okay, I think I think we're live, so I think we'll start now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, Building a Circular Economy for Digital Infrastructure. This is the second online edition of Gruner Pepper. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, this is the sustainability event for education of the future. Uh, it's the place to be inspired by sustainability, and it's the place to connect with experts, students, managers, and teachers. <clears throat> Happy to have you here today. Um, it's great to see how many people are joining us online uh, to gain more knowledge and inspiration in this field. So Green Pepper is an initiative of a group of organizations. Forgive me, I'm going to butcher the uh, pronunciation of this. Reichsdienst für Ondernehmen Nederland, SURF, Studenten für Morgen, uh, the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, which is the organization I work for, and Het Grüne Brain. So before we start um, the discussion, it's a very nice interactive discussion today with some very interesting people. Um, a few house announcements. We do have a chat moderator. Her name's Inky. Um, she can help you with any technical issues. Um, so please also use the chat function on the bottom right and post questions uh, whenever you have them um, and we can send them to our panel of experts who can answer those questions. These webinars will be recorded and they will be published online on greenandpepper.com. Um, those questions can be asked either publicly to everyone or privately so you can play around with who you, actually, who you send those questions to. Um, and again, if you encounter any technical difficulties, um, feel free to reach out to Inky, who's our technical lead, or the classic login and log out also often works. So over to our panel. Today, we're talking about building a circular economy for digital infrastructure. Uh, I'm joined by Astrid Wynn. Astrid is the sustainability lead at TechBuyer and um, all round superstar. Martin van der Veer is head of business development at Sims. Deborah Andrews is Associate Professor at London South Bank University, and Naeem Adibi is Founder and Director of WeLoop. I'm the Discussion Moderator, Mohan Gandhi, Head of Research at the SDIA. So let's get in, let's get over to our questions. First question um, is to Deborah. Deborah, I wonder if you can give me an overview of the Sadasi project. Yes, hello everyone. Um, SADASI is an acronym for Circular Economy for the Data Centre Industry. And um, we, all of the team here today work in the sector, and I think we were all very aware that although it does fantastic things in terms of connecting everyone, um, that there is an awful lot of redundant equipment or equipment that has very, very high embodied impact. That was ending up, uh, it had a short life, uh, and it was ending up either being stockpiled somewhere or ultimately in landfill. So there's a real need to initiate a circular economy where materials are kept in use for as long as technically and uh, economically feasible. They are reclaimed to tend of life and um, circulated back into the system to make new equipment. Um, products are also, product life is also extended, but um, other colleagues will talk about aspects of that uh, practice. And um, so the Sadasi project was set up, it's an international project with partners in Northwest, um, German, uh, Northwest Germany, Northeast France, the Netherlands, of course, and um, the UK. And we, London South Bank University, are the lead, and we're working with experts uh, who are also on the panel today to develop a circular economy for the data center industry. The project started in late 2018, and um, we have just won some additional funding, so it's going to continue until September 2023. And we've got some fantastic outputs, some really interesting results for our research. And um, in addition to that, to doing sort of groundbreaking work, we're also really enjoying collaborating with um, people in different countries and different sectors of the industry. So I hope that summarizes Sadasi adequately. So, yeah, so what makes Sadasi unique and how does it contribute to circular economy? 
Okay, so um, traditionally, um, the, a lot of the people who work in the sector come through traditional engineering education, which is quite um, subjects are taught in isolation. There hasn't really, or in traditional engineering and education, there hasn't really been much crossover between in disciplines. So if you go into civil engineering, that's what you do. If you go into mechanical engineering, that's what you do. And that sort of practice is carried on into the data center industry, which is comprised of about 10 subsectors. And although there's a huge amount of talent and intelligence and so forth um, in each of the sectors, people just didn't talk to each other, which is really um, contrary to what we need for a circular economy. We need to adopt a whole systems and holistic approach to the challenge. And um, so one of the unique things about SADASI is that we have managed to set up um, a network and um, to get people from all these different parts of the industry to work together um, to collaborate. So that really distinguishes our project. Um, and, and again, other colleagues will talk about other aspects of what we're doing, but we, we have three pilot projects. One is looking at design and manufacture. The second is looking at product life extension, and the third is the final sort of bit of the cycle, looking at recycling and materials, in particular critical raw materials reclamation. And we're also developing uh, digital tools to support people um, <clears throat> in decision making um, about you know what what do you do when if you have a server that you no longer want. What's the best option to recycle or retire and recycle or send for refurbishment, or whatever? And we're also looking at very particularly at the um, at critical raw materials, which are very, very important for the sector. Um, they are they're critical because they're um, the availability in the Earth's crust is limited. They're obviously finite resources. They are not. It's not easy to substitute them with other materials. Currently, recycling practice is very limited, and also they're often located in very geopolitically sensitive areas. So we need to really recycle and reuse, reclaim, recycle, reuse those materials, keep them in circulation to ensure that the data center industry can continue with um, uninterrupted service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And Sadasi is um, focusing on the reclamation of critical raw materials that other industries aren't reclaiming yet. So there are two really distinct um, features, if you like, that distinguish Sadasi from other projects. Interesting. Uh, I have a question here from Leo, which is how far is the technology for mining rare materials? Um, I, I think it means how far, how how far, how developed is the technology in recycling? Um, in, for, in recycling, yeah, um, it's it's uh, not very well developed. Um, Naim is probably uh, Naimi DB is um, uh, probably better uh, person or more informed, a better person to talk about the technology than I am because um, he's working directly with TND. We're a French company that are recycling unusual critical raw materials. So, Naim? Yeah, yes, sure. absolutely. Uh, so, um, first of all, we need to define what what do we mean by rare metals? Because um, so it, it depends how we define. Um, what is clear is that the recycling of rare metals or what you call it critical metals or critical raw materials is not very well developed. We are we are recycling quite significant amount of equipment, but it's mainly focusing on the uh, conventional metals like steel, aluminium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we are not focusing on the or copper, for example. But we are not focusing on the critical raw metals like tantalium or other metals. Um, so yes, the rate is quite low. In studies shows that we are under 1% for some of these critical metals. And this is one of the aims of the project because we aim not only to focus on these conventional metals like copper, uh, steel or other metals, but also try to develop small scale, uh, economically viable recycling facilities that allow to, 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 to recycle and recover the metals that are that are in these equipments to a lower quantity. So that's one of the aim of the project, but I think we can come back to that discussion later. 
Mm -hmm. So, so Naeem, if I can stay with you, what are the technical, uh, what are the difficulties in recovering this, these materials? Okay. So, first of all, the, the first of all, the, the, these metals are coming together. So, uh, so we have difficulties to separate the metals. The second point is that they are in the, in low quantities available in the different equipments. Uh, so we have a high dissipation rate in that situation. Also. The, the recycling technologies are, are more sophisticated and complex, so economy, less economically viable. Uh, what we understood from the first steps of the project is that we have big scale recycling facilities. When you have a big scale recycling, you cannot focus your efforts on a specific metal. For example, when you recycle copper, then you do, probably you don't care about recycling uh, other metals that are coming with copper. Like for example, I mentioned tantalium or other metals, uh, or tin or, or or antimony. So, uh, so the issue is that if if we if we can develop specific technologies where the cost is smaller, and these technologies are adaptable because they are small scale investment is smaller, we are able to to be more flexible in the recycling and and probably get a higher rate of recovery from specially critical metals. And what are the, some of the solutions coming out of the Sadasi project? So, uh, so that some solutions are under development. Some of them are, you know, most of them are confidential for the moment because they are <laughs> also in a very research and development, in a very intense research and development phase. This part is done by our a partner TND in in. But one of the aim is that, for example, metals like tantalium that are not recovered. For example, I, I make example on tantalium because tantalium is one of the critical metals where we have difficulties uh, also to, to supply because the supply from the mining is coming from specific regions where we have geopolitical problems, tensions, and also mining is, 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 is problematic. So we are trying to, 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 to develop technologies to, to recycle and recover those metals. Then if we go to the, for example, to hard drives, uh, then you have problem with the rare earth metals, but that's not a topic we are dealing with directly in the Sedasi project. We are focusing more on the on the printed circuit boards and the components that are in the printed circuit boards and the main components of the of the servers. But we will at the same time look at the the, the rare earth metals in the. So, yeah. so we're trying to develop technologies that can make it, make it easier to recycle certain metals but also broaden the scope of what metals we can recycle it's not even it's not even easier so in some cases it's even make it possible because today it's not possible you know for example some of these metals are going directly to the waste they are mm. when you recycle for example copper you have some residues that are in the form of waste and most of the time are stocked or landfilled or and 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 an important part of these metals are finding these residues and not recovered today Mm -hmm. Our aim is that, first of all, before uh, trying to recycle copper, because recycling copper is quite, it's, it's not quite easy, but is 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 easy, you know, we don't need uh, a lot of technological challenges to recover copper, for example, from a printed circuit board. We want first to try to recover the metals, the critical raw metals that are in, inside, and then we can have the copper for a conventional copper recycling. So that's what you are doing. So there are different uh, technologies of recycling that are that are under test phase, uh, and we have some good results. And I hope that soon we can announce some 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 really interesting in information. But we cannot still go to the details because some of them are are the the the, the rights and property rights of the partners who are doing this R and D and development. Yeah. Thank you, Naeem. So that we were there, we talked a lot about recycling. I'd like to bring in Astrid now to talk about refurbishing. Um, in in particular, why refurbishing is is important in building a circular economy, and then also giving us the UK perspective. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, we've already given quite a lot of that answer in in what's wrong with recycling. Um, I think people from outside the industry often assume that recycling is your best answer. Um, given the complex nature of the equipment that we're looking at, it's very difficult to recover 100% of those materials for all the reasons that we've just talked about. Um, so refurbishment has other benefits as well. Um, firstly, um, it is a lower value energy user than recycling technologies. It doesn't rely on heat in the same way. We've got an element of testing 
in the equipment, but it's not as energy intensive. So from an environmental standpoint, that's a benefit. Um, and then the other benefit is that it tends to be a reasonably high value job proposition. Um, because to refurbish effectively, what you're doing is you're breaking down the machines to component parts. You're testing each of those component parts and you are processing those component parts in unique ways. And when it comes to rebuilding machines, um, which has an element of re-engineering and upgrading performance, um, then you need to understand what you're doing. You need to understand which component goes with what and what the limitations of the system are. There's quite a lot of human intervention there and quite a lot of education um, in the sector um, of, and it's a growth sector as well. So uh, that's another economic advantage to refurbishment. Uh, Martin, I will be speaking in a minute. He's from a crossover sector to ours. He also deals with refurbishment. We're both getting a lot of inquiries at the moment because of moves towards build back better. Um, and the fact that IT de um, doesn't degrade over time. So you can rebuild machines and improve machines and avoid the need for buying new equipment and still get the performance that's possible. Um, on the legislation side in the uh, UK at the moment, we've got a greening ICT policy that's come out of DEFRA, um, which handles the material side of our sustainability policies in the UK. Um, that is asking for a percentage increase of refurbished and remanufactured equipment inside the IT estate. That's huge because they've given themselves less than five years to do that in their own IT estate and also in that of their supply chain. So we're expecting to see a big increase in refurbishment and remanufacture in coming years, um, which will be supported by projects like Sadasi because we're putting some data and some academic rigor behind the process, which means it's being, being scrutinized. So, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now I'd like to bring Mar Martin um, from his perspective with Sims. Um, if Martin, if you could talk about a little bit about what you do at Sims and then also the Dutch and maybe the EU perspective from a leg legislative standpoint. Um, yeah, well, Sims is, uh, is a global company publicly traded um, and we're an IT provider, uh, which means uh, we service, uh, we provide service to our clients on a global scale, uh, taking back their uh, end of life equipment, well, end of cycle for them, uh, the, the, the first user. Um, yeah, as mentioned earlier by, by the others, technical uh, capabilities of that, that, that equipment. Yeah, that, that's not, that's still there, right? It's, uh, it, 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 it isn't written off. Uh, in, in three years, for example, so we can reuse it, um, uh, and that's what we do. Uh, we de we take it in uh, for data centers, workplace equipment, uh, and um, yeah, we really need to do this because looking at, for example, now uh, COVID, chip shortage, uh, new equipment cannot be produced by the manufacturers. So yeah, we're. we're uh, committing to that, uh, yeah, we need to commit as, 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 as an industry to refurbishment as well, because we don't want to be dependent on new equipment getting into the market and, um, uh, yeah, being challenged by the chip shortage. Yeah? So everything is being delayed, um, on, on new equipment. So from, from that point of view, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's good to have it in our own hands and don't be dependent on OEMs for new equipment. Um, myself, uh, I'm, I'm responsible for trading uh, within the EMEA region, within SIMS. It's, uh, it's a big market. Uh, and I'm, I'm mainly focusing on data center equipment. Um, we use a lot of Lansing, uh, probably the Dutch people know what I'm referring to. Uh, reuse is, uh, is, is on top of it there, so uh, reusing the equipment where possible as always preference, keep it in country preference as well. Um, if technical issues or commercially uh, issues are there on the equipment, 
that yeah, we, we have a couple, we, we have a threshold on, uh, on, on the equipment that, that comes in, of course, either on technical uh, perspective or commercial perspective, because we don't want to have it end up uh, for two euros. We can sell it to, uh, to another country and uh, it, it ends up in, uh, in three months in a landfill, right? So uh, we as Sims take responsibility for that part as well. And the unique position that we have is that we also have in-house recycling. So first uh, refurbishment, then recycling, uh, getting getting the critical raw material, uh, which is commercially interesting at the moment to uh, reclaim. Um, yeah, we, we, we take care of that pro part of the process as well. Um, and I'm really uh, happy that Naeem uh, will speak a lot has spoken about Pentland as well, uh, because this is, this is something that is being wasted and this is uh, because it's not commercially interesting to set it up and, and reclaim it at the moment. So these kinds of projects where we are involved as well, amongst Sadasi, this is really, these are big steps in the right direction. So uh, yeah, I'm really happy to, uh, to be part of, uh, of, of this uh, working group. Uh, to be honest, of the end project. Um, Martin, I, I have a, a question for you. Um, yeah. Does, re, does <clears throat> assuming the market, say, for refurbishing, if that was to improve and increase, would that undermine the recycling element of the solution? Um, well, recycling, well, reusing is it's, 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 a, it's a good form of uh, recycling, right? Yeah. Basically, so um, as long as I think the aim should be that we either have yeah, zero to, to a couple of percent of, of e-waste left after we reuse or recycling. So I think the whole, uh, looking at it from, from a helicopter, um, it should uh, yeah, strengthen it, each other, right? Um, the more sustainable we, we are, it, it, yeah, it, it needs to collaborate. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be an issue. Uh, gaining a bigger market for the, for the remarketing or reuse uh, compared to the recycling. I think it's all <coughs> sustainable, right? We need to work on the best possible solution to, to create as, as little uh, e-waste as possible. Deborah, did you have a? Did you want to come in here? Yeah, yeah. Just to um, sort of add to what Martine has said, um, I guess as um, you know, school, college students, young people, beginning at university, whatever, um, you grew. You're all digital natives. You know, you've grown up with digital technology. You can't remember a time when we didn't have data centres or service, more particularly services provided by data centres. But um, you know. Anyone sort of in their thirties, the story is very different. The industry has grown from zero uh, to and now. There are seven point seven million data centres around the world, so it's grown incredibly rapidly. And all the services associated with digital communication have evolved very, very rapidly as well. What's astonishing, and that's really since the introduction of the World Wide Web in the very late nineteen eighties and early nineteen nineties. So 30 years of growth from zero to 7.7 .7 million centers. The other thing is um, that um, because digital services are continually evolving and, and increasing, and we are beginning to um, experience the Internet of Things where um, all products are connected to the <clears throat> Internet in some way or another, so that their behaviors, their energy consumption, whether they need spare parts, whatever it may be, can be monitored. So the sector is predicted to continue to grow in the in Europe by 300% on 1980 uh, sorry 2018 figures it's increasing threefold 300% and by 2030 globally it will have increased 500%. So I think not only do we need um recycling and reclamation of redundant equipment at night we desperately need to extend product life of everything that's around. Um, and because we will still continue to 
produce new equipment, but we need all of these things to ensure that we can, the industry can meet the requirements on, and demand of everyone who wants to access the services. Yeah, and, and looking at looking at the, the, the new solution, new solution, it's not even some new solution, right? The OCP project um, with the open cute, this makes a big big difference as well. And hyperscalers are uh, setting up OCP uh, hardware. Um, so although the the, the the volume grows uh, for data and connect connectivity in general, and data sharing. Um, uh, yeah, I think that looking at the uh, OCP, that you, you solely looking at the components and upgrading the components. It's it's yeah, you don't have to uh, produce a new switch, a new server every time eh, in full. So the in interaction and the ch interchangeable components, and yeah, this will make a difference as well. So this is a is a good step in the in the right direction. Astrid, did you have something that you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, just on what building on Deborah's point about the growth of the sector, yes, it is growing fast, which means that we're going to have to do even more with already to limited supplies of critical raw materials. So that's not just happening in the digital sector, it's happening in renewables as well. There's quite a lot of crossover between the materials that we need in digital and the materials that you need to build solar panels or wind farms, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think that's worth highlighting as well. If we're going to capture the best out of the green revolution, we need to be really, really careful about the way we use materials. And that's one of the core, I, I would say, what, what makes Sadasi quite different because it, there is no silver bullet. There's uh, extending uh, product life, there's uh, almost like extending the second product life, there's preparing recycling at end of life. So it actually, Sadasi project tackles quite a few aspects of um, what it what it means to be more sustainable. Um, Astrid, I'd like to go back to you um, in terms of what are the challenges to refurbishment? Numerous. I'll start with some simple ones. Uh, there's the technical side of refurbishment. Um, there is a limit to what you can put with what. So some components can be changed out completely and put in new machines. That's storage devices, memory, things like that. Others cannot. They're tied to a make and model of server. Um, one of the things that's coming out of Sadasi is that may not be necessary. So the fans have an individual design for each individual server. What the reason for that is, is unclear. Um, and that's one of the things that the project's challenging. Um, but there are good reasons why you can't put a new CPU in an old machine. Basically, the CPU won't work. Um, so that side of it's quite complex. It, it has to be learned with each successive generation that comes out. More of a challenge are the software applications that go with the hardware and um, proprietary moves of the uh, original equipment manufacturers to block hardware reuse by software applications. So that's things like firmware updates. And that's being incorporated into the Eco Design Directive, but there are other areas of that that are a little bit more gray. Um, so that's something that I, believe legislators are working on at EU level um, and trying to come to an understanding there. The biggest barrier that I'd say for that is in the way of refurbishment becoming mainstream is perceived risk. So a lot of people, despite the bathtub curve and evidence to the contrary, are worried that um, they don't necessarily think the equipment will fail but they do think that if the equipment does fail and they've used refurbished hardware as opposed to new hardware, then they're gonna have quite a lot of justifying to do. Um, there is good evidence in the form of an IEEE paper, which we can share the link with later, that IT equipment does not degrade over time, that the performance of refurbished 
hardware is exactly the same as new hardware on like-for-like -like components and systems. There's also evidence that Moore's law, which was the traditional argument against using refurbished hardware that you'd lose on the energy bill, slowdowns in Moore's law mean that you can now upgrade immediate past generations to make them outperform newer generations. So in simple terms, you can get an old machine to give you more compute power than a new machine if you configure it correctly. Um, and that piece of research has been important um, in convincing people and demonstrating this, but also in moves that the industry is making towards standards organisations like TCO Certified and others who have an interest in driving the sustainability agenda and trying to formalise that process. Um, so I'd say those are the biggest barriers, but I'm quite hopeful because I think there's quite a lot going on at the moment that's um, bringing refurbishment further into the mainstream and supporting that. I'd be interested to know what Sims see in this space. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Martin, she, uh, she handed the question back to you about how you see this space developing first in terms of standards and second in terms of regulations. Um, yeah, wow. Well, um, <laughs> not sure where I need to begin uh, in this case, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, I believe that um, there's already good knowledge uh, within the industry of reusing and also the, the power uh, and the technical capabilities of reused uh, equipment or refurbished equipment. Um, because if you look at the marketplace uh, as, as it is at the moment, it's huge, right? In EMEA globally, um yeah there's a there there's a lot of uh demand demand on that part right because it's not only on the technical uh, part that it that it still uh, uh yeah works for the applications that 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 needs to need to run because uh hyperscalers for, for example uh, looking at uh, looking at those companies the aws microsoft um, refreshing quicker than, than than others. They can design in their own hand uh, because they have specific requirements. Yeah, th 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 this, um, this is not uh, for everybody, right? Not all enterprises, uh, not all other uh, corporates need that new technology. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, and even the the. the we as as a as, as as a public as a consumer as a data user we are um yeah accelerating the refresh cycle of the hyperscalers hyperscalers uh, adjust their requirements on our demand and the more data we use the, the like the netflix is tiktoks all the the, the cloud-based uh Applications, yeah, this uh, accelerates uh, the, the the refresh cycle for hyperscalers, but the rest, the legacy hardware, uh, legacy hardware is, is uh, uh, in general still, yeah, will still be around and uh, still have to take technical capabilities for, for coming years. So we need to have this uh, addressed and yeah, expand even the, the market still. Uh, there's still growing potential because, yeah, I believe yeah, the, 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 the refurbished hardware is really good still and can beat new still uh, uh, as well as Austin uh, just, just mentioned because, yeah, if you configure it correct uh, for, the, for the solution that you need and application that you need to run, yeah, refurbished hardware can, uh, can, can outbeat uh, new hardware anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Uh, lovely answer. Nice way to finish the first part of this. So we're about half an hour in now. So I'd like to go to Inky and she's going to start a little interactive quiz to uh, 
to wake some of you up. I can see some people nodding off. Um, grab a coffee and log into the Menti quiz. Inky, if you could take the screen um, and I'll talk people through how it works. Um, and obviously, in the meantime, Deborah's just posted the uh, link to the Sadasi project if someone wants to take a look at that. So, if everyone can go to www.menti.com and use the code that you can see on screen, um, and it will take you to an interactive quiz. We've prepared a few questions um, to test your knowledge. I have to say they are quite, they're very difficult questions. I didn't get a single one right. <clears throat> Oh, there's the answers. <laughs> My apologies. I hope I clicked away very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Enter the code at the top, 30663783. Um, pick an avatar, and then uh, we can start the quiz. I think we're ready, uh, Inky. Of the 17 rare earth materials, how many can be found in your smartphone? So no cheating name because he, he actually probably knows this one but um 17 rare rare earth materials how many can be found in your smartphone uh the correct answer is actually 16. um and these aren't the, the materials that you think of this isn't copper and gold and stuff this is the the really funky ones scandium cerium Holmium, erbium, I don't know. no one knows where they live on the periodic table. On to the next question. How many hours of HD video can be stored in a terabyte? How many hours of HD video stored in a terabyte? Five hundred, yeah. That's I think it's two giga per HD video. Obviously it's an approximation. Um What's the relevance of this question? Well, the next question will make it make it clear. What's the storage capacity of YouTube in, in terabytes? If one terabyte is 500 hours of HD video. Four million, so a lot of people said four million terabytes. What's interesting about this, I think we have old data because YouTube, the amount that they store is accelerating every day. And I had a little, had a little Google peruse this morning and I think they add about 20 terabytes per day, um, which is phenomenal. And I think our numbers are a little bit old. <laughs> and on to the last question of the quiz. What percentage of materials in your phone can be recycled?
and at least five people got that right. Excellent, 80%. Um, that's the end of the quiz, um, which is, I think, quite good timing. We have five minutes left in the in the session. Um, Ingrid wins. Ingrid P and Dieter, congratulations. Um, fantastic. <laughs> um, Inky, if we can can go back to the actually it doesn't matter. I, I'd like to close with my last question to send it to to Deborah. Uh, you said something earlier about circularity and traditional design being linear, um, which means with this circularity, actually what's necessary is a lot of different perspectives. So I wonder yeah. if you could talk about your background and how you got into this industry. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I'm actually one of the things that I'm proudest of is being a chartered environmentalist. Um, but my background is in product design originally. I went to art school and had purple hair and ridiculously tight skirts and high heeled shoes. And it very difficult. It was very difficult to get on and off the bus. I did the whole art school thing and then eventually I went to work um, in consultancies and so forth um, and was invited to teach and ended up working at London South Bank University. But rather than in, um, an arts based design course, it was a more technical design course, um, BSc. Um, <clears throat> and from there I moved into more and more technical design. I'd always been interested in the environment. So I've been working in this sort of field of research for a long time. Um, and um, it's it's become a passion, really, I suppose. So um, in terms of circularity, I mean, we've been looking at um, all the things that comp constitute the circular economy for a long time. So um, things like um, extending product life designing, products that can be easily repaired um, and upgraded for reuse or they're modular or whatever, um, designing products that uh, enable easy and economical disassembly and recycling of materials. And um, I've worked with the data center industry now for about 10 years involved in research projects. Originally, we started off just looking at the a total environmental impact of data center, a full life cycle assessment, looking at the building and all the um, M&E systems and so forth <clears throat> in the building, as well as IT equipment. We found that um, the IT, that, that was the real sort of hotspot, environmental hotspot. And then from that and work with um, consultancies and so forth, because uh, one of the big challenges in the sector is that um, there's a huge amount of emphasis on energy, operational energy efficiency, and there's now a realisation that we can't just look at that. We've got to look at, um, if you like, resource uh, efficiency, materials efficiency as well. So um, from working with uh, people in the data centre industry, I became aware that there was this sort of gap of um, knowledge and so forth. and. Um, Came up with the concept for the Sudasi project. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. We built a fantastic team um, with the mentioned before partners in France, the Netherlands, Germany, as well as the UK. We just got an extension, not only to extend the project length, but also our kind of geographical scope. So we're also including partners in. Uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Ireland as well now. So hopefully we will make, you know, a real impact. It's impossible to change the industry. You know, we're a small group of people. There are about 20 of us in the really sort of hard or central team. It's impossible for us to change the industry on our own when you think about the scale of it. But what we're doing is really uh, raising awareness um, and, and making people um, consider carefully what they do with their equipment, helping them to realise the value of the equipment, not just as a, a sort of aid to processing and storing data, but as a, you know, an artefact in its own right. It's got a lot of um, economic and technical and value embodied in all the materials. So Brilliant. hopefully that explains a bit, bit of a wiggly route to get to where I am, but um, 
I have a very nice time at work, I must say, you know, working with lots of different people from different sort of uh, occupations and so forth. Thank you, Deborah. So I'd like to bring the session to a close now. I think we've almost run out of time. Thank you, Naeem, Deborah, Martijn and Astrid um, for talking about Sadasi and the circular economy. Um, this session will be uploaded to grunapepper.com um, and obviously the, in, in the links you'll find the IEEE paper that Astrid mentioned and the Sadasi website. Thank you for joining us and take care. Thank you very much, Thank you. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. We didn't talk about how to end the end the meeting. <laughs> oh, oh no, how do we do that? There's a, a red cross. If I click this, I might disappear. No. Oh, leave meeting. Or should we can end it for everyone if we click on this, I think, Inky. Uh, yeah, would you like to do a little recap or can I just close it? Well, I hope the audience found it interesting. I think I think we packed quite a lot of content into quite a short period of yeah. time, so I'm I'm pretty pretty happy. I, mean. I, I only got one of the questions right. <laughs> the Mentimeter quiz, how embarrassing is that? <laughs> oh God, back to school, I think. <laughs> Never mind. Everybody else is staying stum. Astrid, did you get them all right? No. <laughs> Not one single one. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was very challenging. It was really good, really good. Yeah, I didn't see any any pre-defined uh, questions, Mark. This was uh, coming as a surprise, so I hadn't, I didn't have anything right. <laughs> I mean, it, it's no. it's in the Word doc if you wanted to have a look at it. Ahead yeah, of time. Right. I didn't want You're to right. cheat. I found that, and I thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, I better. Yeah. Sorry, no, I better ahead. run because a colleague actually phoned me in the middle of the meeting, even though I said I was busy. So I better go and have a quick chat to her. So nice to see everybody. Yes, nice to see you. Take care. See you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you.